But I, do, I see these layer twos not just as a scalability solution, but rather a way to extend what Ethereum can be, could be, or it perhaps should be. Um, so I'm very delighted that I have with me these three amazing people who are running like what in my biased opinion is perhaps the most unique and coolest layer twos in the space. Um, so I would love for three of you to just introduce yourselves, talk about what you're building very briefly before we get into like the cool things of your systems. Yeah, hey everyone, uh, my name's Joe. I'm one of the co-founders of Aztec, and I, I lead product. Um, Aztec's a privacy layer for Ethereum, um, and we currently have Aztec Connect Live, which is a VPN for all of DeFi, and we're working on a fully private VM, uh, which has private smart contracts. Hi, my name is Louis. I'm ecosystem at Starkware. Um, we have Starkware for over three years and a half. Uh, so Starkware is building uh, scalability solutions using zero-knowledge proof, more specifically Starks. Um, our first product you may have used is called StarkX. It is the one powering Sorer, Immutable, DYDX, Diversify, and plenty of others that are going to announce soon. And in the last year and a half, almost now, we started to work on uh, StarkNet, which is a general purpose layer two on top of Ethereum, enabling scaling using uh, a Turing complete language called Cairo. Uh, hello. So my name is Nick. I'm the CEO of Fuel Labs, um, and you know, to describe Fuel in a simple way, um, you can think of it like a layer two. We launched the first optimistic rollup to Ethereum. Uh, that was a fully trustless, um, you know, optimistic rollup, no multi-sig, anything. Um, and to describe uh, what we do, uh, we have a new kind of uh, transaction processing system, um, and this can take the form of something like a Validium, it can take the form of something like a layer two. Um, and we use UTXOs for this, we use a different paradigm from you know, typical uh, Ethereum systems. We have our own language called Sway, uh, which is used to target this system. Um, we have our own tooling, we have um, basically a revised version of everything Ethereum offers. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we're here to help Ethereum scale uh, and basically incorporate all of the lessons that we've learned from you know, production Ethereum over the years, uh, provide Ethereum a, a new and different kind of pathway to scale uh, that isn't uh, the EVM uh, you know, tool chains and, and EVM uh, processing systems. Very cool, all right, so we have like, we have a good mix of people here. We have like two companies building zero knowledge, we have two companies using UTXOs, but if all of you have like such unique branding and products. So like, let's, let's go for a very first principle approach. Before I ask why you chose non-EVM, can I ask why, no, why should blockchains just not use normal VMs, like I don't know, x86 or RAM? Why is it so necessary to build something new? Uh, I think I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. So um, x86 and these other instruction sets are really designed for uh, different computing architectures. So, you know, when you're designing x86, you're designing ARM, you're designing them to target uh, a hardware system. And so that's going to come with its own criteria and its own um, restrictions and physics. Um, whereas with a blockchain virtual machine, you're, you're designing for a different kind of physics. So you're pricing every operation, you're designing for adversarial scenarios. And because of this, you end up having odd design constraints that really put you in a corner and you have to really understand those physics to design a good virtual machine that will both be you know, great for processing but also be great for security. So it really is kind of an art designing some of these systems and we've learned a lot since the you know, kind of inception of Bitcoin um, in 2008 all the way through to, to now. And um, you know, ba basically, uh, it, those those instruction sets are for different purposes. Whereas um, you know, virtual machines for blockchains are categorically a different thing. Um, now you can do it, but you do lose some of the nice things. Whereas if you had designed it from scratch, you you basically can kind of design a better world. So yeah. Uh, I was just going to add, I think like compatibility is one of the main kind of reasons why we have to limit the feature set on uh, blockchain uh, kind of VMs. Like you have multiple clients trying to all get to the same uh, kind of state update and 
that doesn't exist in the world of kind of like Intel um, chips. So it's just, yeah, it's a much harder problem. And that usually means we get a limited feature set uh, like we have in the EVM. No, I don't really have much to say. I mean, the, the technical aspect was very defined. Yeah. Blockchain VMs as an art is really a good way to put it. Put it. Hi. So what are your expectations from a blockchain EVM then? Uh, from a blockchain VM, like what are the things we've learned from the EVM? What are the things that you wanted, couldn't get, built your own things? Uh, I think just a starting point is probably like the more complex the VM is, I think the harder it is to scale. Um, <laughs> we're seeing this yeah. with kind of people trying to prove computation at EVM and yeah. you need like giant data centers to actually construct that proof. So a simple kind of maybe tailored feature set of the VM is probably going to result in more scalability. That's maybe the first point. What are your expectations from a blockchain VM? And this goes to like Go. things you can get from EVM. Yeah, so, so um, th the thing is that what we were expecting from a, a VM, a blockchain VM, uh, before and now changed. It changed significantly between the origin of Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and what we know now. And I guess one of the main difference is that um, we now realize more than ever that we need scalability and we now discover that we there are tech that gave that scalability while preserving the core principle of, of, of blockchains and the core principle of blockchain is you know trustlessness and verif uh, verifiability and before and i'm going to toot my own horn obviously in and talk about zk here before the the arrival of zk as a practical technique to bring uh, very uh, fast verification we just went to, to the shortest, to the simplest, which was the EVM. Um, and now that we, we are looking at those new tech and this new knowledge that we're learning, you know, what Fuel is doing or what Solana is doing and what others chain are doing, um, we are bringing the new, you know, more top-notch computer science to it and, and which are providing more feature sets that we are looking for to, to, develop, to develop good product, good dApps on top of, crypto, on top of blockchains. Very well said. Yeah, I guess over time our expectations have changed quite a lot. Yeah, I would say so coming from sort of like 2015, 2016 blockchain to now, um, you know, like I've been using Ethereum almost since it started. So for me, it's been like, you know, a long road. Um, and I would say that the expectations have completely changed, I think. But just as well, we didn't, the community didn't fully understand all the design constraints when they were putting it together. And there was decisions made uh, over time, particularly with the kinds of architectures that Ethereum chose, uh, that ended up being really costly for just compute and, and for all the different kinds of design potential that you want. Um, and as well, backwards compatibility was something that, you know, it was, was not really kind of in part of the, the picture. Um, and I think it's ended up locking us into a design that wasn't really educated on what could potentially happen if we had this design, and so we're just yeah. sort of stuck with it. So, um, you know, I think the expectations are that, you know, again, you, you design a safe VM, you design a virtual machine that can provide all the behaviors we like for Ethereum, but as well open up a lot of new kinds of designs that we currently don't see, that we'd like to see. Um, and then on top of that, um, you know, just designing for, um, you know, a lot of different uh, scenarios where if you could have done it a different way, um, you would have factored in all the research that we have. You can basically, y you can create a new reality for blockchain that, that I think is much stronger than, than what we have now. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, like one example is probably like the curve that we all sign over. <laughs> so we've, we've, all, we've all got a seed phrase um, and it's kind of hasn't really changed in, in a while. People have tried doing smart contract wallets, but if you control the VM, uh, everyone in the room's got uh, an iPhone or an Android that's got a TPM in it and you can actually build that into the VM and, and help get adoption. So yeah, recreating all of the, the EVM, I think would be a mistake and just trying to kind of focus on adoption uh, in the feature set would be a good thing. And, and um, um, you know, the, the, when, when specifically about the, the change uh, that we are expecting now from the VM, there are a couple of examples which are just so significant, so clear that the, the, the tar goal target moved. Uh, Aragon, when they launched, they were like, you know, this massive OS for, for DAO was like very well thought out. The point that it was way too expensive. I mean, yeah. back then, no one cared. You know, when they started, you know, using a whole block for yourself was like, who cares? No one's here. 
And now, you know, uh, you try to optimize, like we have all those people on, on Twitter doing those gas golf thing to a point which is just ridiculous, right? And, yeah. and so um, one thing that I'm, I'm, we're observing specifically in the context of StarkNet and the new language that we have is that when you provide new like feature set and new capacity to the chain, you get like a combination of creativity that you like new thing that don't exist before. And so um, um, Joe here was talking about uh, the curve we're using or the fact that we have EOAs. EOAs was a mistake in retrospect. And the problem with that EOAs is that they put us in a, in a local uh, equilibrium. There is no way smart contract wallet will pick up on Ethereum today because it's always cheaper to use EOAs. It's always cheaper to use my private keys. And so there is no incentive for the dApps to actually build their application to be very well compatible with Red Connect or just you know to work well with smart contract wallets. And some, some, even some just ban them because they're smart contract. And so um, in the context of StarkNet, what we, because we don't have UAs, we only have smart contract in, and therefore only smart contract wallet, we have people using the native curve of the, of the network called the Stark curve. And now we're also people trying to build using the trusted enclave of your iPhone. So within the same wallet, you can actually use your iPhone, you can, uh, you, you can use any curve that you want, you can use the brothers that have also a curve in it. And so we, we, once you unlock the limitation that we know, you start having new things that, that get created uh, basically right away. Yeah, I agree with you. I think asking engineers to gas golf instead of thinking about innovative things to do is a big waste of time and probably prevents a lot of innovation that could have happened in the space by far. Yeah, just just to speak to that too. So, like I've done my share of gas golfing. <laughs> like I just I want to say I'm like you can check my GitHub like it's it's sort of like an art for me, but it was more of a therapeutic thing to gas golf than it was like a this is a good use of my time. Mind you that was before I worked with fuel. So, you know, started fuel. So essentially, yeah. Um, the thing is is you can gas golf all you want, but it's not enough. And it's never enough because when enough people use the system, it just gets congested and then you're, you're back to where you started. And you keep asking the same questions like, well, how could we do this? How could OpenSea run in this way? You know? And then the thing is, is you lock yourself in so much to just trying to support this thing, which by the way, I mean, there's some controversy around it, but the EVM was sort of designed a little quickly and was put together a little fast. and. At DevCon 1, there was some conversations about that particular thing, if you want some spice. But anyway, the, the, the reality is, is, you know, I've been sitting here looking at this machine for years, like years and years and years. And it's held a lot of different kinds of designs back because it can't move forward. Like, it really is very, very difficult to move forward. So, um, you know, the fact that these teams are sort of bold enough to still be part of Ethereum but try to do it differently just for the sake of like getting to global adoption and getting somewhere else, I think is a, is a, you know, it's a sign of how good the Ethereum community is because, you know, we're not afraid to challenge what people have made a culture of the system. And I think that that's a, it's a very beautiful thing, you know? So, but yeah, it's not all just Vitalik and Gavin's design that gets yeah. to run the show, you know? I mean, we can try to do other things. And with layer twos, we can now, so it's great. Yeah, yeah exactly, like layer twos should be seen as a way to extend everything that we can't do in Ethereum, not just a cheap transaction machine. Yeah. Sort of sorry, you have to something? No, yeah. Yeah, about the, you know, everyone comes to say about, uh, yeah, it's always about cheap. No, it's not about cheap, <laughs> really not about cheap. I can give you a few example of things that are, are being built that you just like, could dream of anywhere else on uh, Ethereum. And so for instance, um, uh, smart contract wallet is most specifically like an important one because smart contract wallet is no one, okay, crypto, crypto if will not get global adoption if we have to keep a key. And if the EOA's mechanism, like having a private key remains, basically we're gonna go back to the financial system where we have five global custodial. And, and that's not what we want. And so on the smart contract part, um, we are now things that are getting unlocked. For instance, uh, Argent with the, in the t around here actually are it's working on extensively on, on StarkNet and they are working on a plugging system, meaning you can actually install an app in your wallet. Meaning that, for instance, every time you spend, 10% goes to saving. Or every time you, you want to play a game, you actually don't have to sign every transaction. You can open a session key that's going to last six hours and that is only authorized to do a set of operations. And so, 
really the cheap transaction is like an afterthought. It's just a requirement. And honestly, to be honest, I don't think it's going to last long. Like L2 themselves will not be cheap. I have a theory which is you can't have a cheap, successful economical layer because there is no reason in the universe what that my ticketing app that is trading or where I can change my NFT, my, my NFT of my ticket be impacted by the fact that the big price of ETH dropped by 20%. And all of a sudden, my app doesn't work anymore. And so that just doesn't happen. That just won't work. Insanely refreshing to hear. Maybe, yeah. maybe I want to go into a pivot over here. And like what enables all of your architectures to actually be able to do these things? I'd love to, I think everyone here would love to know more about these architectural decisions they've made that enable these new paradigms here. Okay, so if we're so we all get what you're saying is we can all shill a little bit, yeah. just like a little permission bit for each shill. project. Okay, yeah, all right, I'll try to. Shill, to okay, I'm going to try to keep my shilling channel. in a kind of a dome, so some some highlights. But nice. okay, so first of all, the Fuel VM is highly inspired by the EVM. So all the lessons that we've learned with the EVM over the years, it tries to incorporate. It doesn't leave that behind. It doesn't try to say we're arrogant enough to rebuild everything. So that's the first thing. We've basically taken all the great EIPs, all the great research that the Ethereum community has done and other blockchain communities have done and put it into a virtual machine. Now we've made some very interesting decisions um, and they all impact the kinds of things you can build, the, the kinds of experiences you can create and as well the scale that you can achieve with this particular system. So. Some highlights are it's UTXO based, so that's the first thing. Secondly, you get smart contracts, just like Ethereum. There's no loss in any kind of behavior from a developer. Secondly, scripts is another one. So in Ethereum, you have to go through a smart contract to make multiple calls. It's ridiculous. It never should have been that way. Um, so we have scripts, and then we, as well, we have account abstraction via what we call predicates. And so this allows you to send to the hash of a script, and essentially if the script returns true, then you can spend the output. And this gives you all kinds of things you can do. For example, we can support signing with a Solana key um, over uh, a UTXO that is USDC from Ethereum. You, like, that's pretty nuts, you know? And that can happen at, it's cool. Uh, and then that can happen in like an output. You can also do things like, um, you know, Basic, well, some, some other cool stuff um, is we've redesigned all the, the processing within the virtual machine as well, such that when you make a smart contract call with Fuel, instead of having to serialize, and the engineers will know this, I, I'm sorry if you're not an engineer, so it's just bear with me, but when you make a call, you don't need to re-serialize the data between smart contracts. It's all in one chunk of memory, but the memory is segmented per call frame. And what that does is it allows you to go, I'll write 5,000 things to memory here, I'll call this contract over here, and that other contract can just reference any one of those items. So you can imagine trading engines, things like this, would love that because you can write so much to memory. You can really abuse memory and you can abuse compute, which we have a lot more of, um, and not storage. So we give you far more options to use that are not storage oriented. So these are all part of the processing model, but. So you know, lastly, for the last bit of shill, um, this also, because it's a UTXO model, you get all the nice things of Ethereum, but you get full, complete parallel processing. So you can, you know, basically have all the benefits of some of these newer ecosystems that have parallel processing. But because the Fuel VM is designed to be arbitrated, it can also be a roll up or layer two on Ethereum directly. And on top of that, it has trust minimized light clients. So you're not leaving behind the nice security properties what we have with Ethereum. So that's my shill on the VM. Yeah, you go. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, ours is also UTXO model. Um, big fan of UTXOs. They're very difficult, but um, they do enable kind of uh, some important features which uh, the account model lacks. And in our case, that's privacy. Um, so it's very hard to do privacy in an account-based model because every time you update an account, you leak which account you're updating. Um, so in UTXO model, uh, we can create and destroy UTXOs uh, and they all look random. Uh, so that's one of the key kind of design choices we had to make to get privacy. And then kind of uh, more in, into the VM, um, we also have account <laughs> abstraction built into Aztec. So we have this concept of a viewing key and a spending key. Um, 
when things are encrypted, uh, there's a different set of people who may need to see the data to those who can spend it. Uh, so I think yeah, being able to control that has been uh, super beneficial uh, for our architecture. Um, today, the VM only supports um, kind of circuits or programs that, that we've written, uh, but we're expanding it um, with a concept called Aztec 3, which uh, Mike from Aztec is actually talking about tomorrow um, on one of the other stages. Uh, and the main kind of uh, improvements there are that uh, every program is actually uh, a client-side generated ZK snark. Um, so we've built a language called Noir, which enables developers to write these programs. Um, and then users will actually, instead of sending this to be executed uh, on kind of a node, they'll actually compute the snark in the browser in Noir, prove the correct running of the program, and then send that kind of packaged up kernel circuit to a rollup provider. And that means you actually get really cool features like code privacy, um, uh, confidentiality, and anonymity. So we're excited about that. Um, so in the context of, of StarkNet and, and StarkWare, um, we also created our own VM, um, but and focusing only on, on scaling, uh, kind of similarly to Fuel. And I just want to sort of make a differentiation in terms of scaling between the Fuel approach to, um, which is basically parallelization, enabling the execution layer to do more, and the ZK approach, which is basically requiring less from the verifier. And those are orthogonal, completely orthogonal. So you can get both, potentially. But the, the reason why I'm making that, 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 um, that the differentiation is because, uh, the, in some way, the way StarkNet scale is by saying, you know what? Validators can have stronger machine than the rest of the world. Today, when you look at Ethereum, or any blockchain like Bitcoin, the the, the, your, your limit, the scaling is limited by uh, the weakest machine in the network. And so when we compare the TPS or whatever, I mean, the, the, not the throughput of Bitcoin versus the throughput of Ethereum versus the throughput of Solana, we are comparing Apple, Oranges, and Ferrari. Uh, and, and the reason is very simple. Bitcoin target a Raspberry Pi, which is roughly the cheapest computer you can find. Um, Ethereum says, okay, you, we are targeting, this is a bit too constrained for the real world application. Maybe we can have like a $2,500 machine. So for instance, I synced Eve completely on my lap, my 2021 um, M1 Apple book, my book, uh, like a month ago, two months ago. And, um, and Solana is like, you know what? $2,000 machine is very constrained because companies, they, they pay that for like a, a flight for their employees to, to Bogota. Uh, and so maybe we can have a 2,500 machine per month. That's a practical uh, cost for servers for a, an entity for, for corporate. And so we are really not comparing the same thing. And so when you're looking at the, the, um, the limitation of scaling for all those blockchain is the weakest point. What is the minimum machine the, the network needs to have? And so when you use a regular um, traditional um, execution layer, uh, without using crypto, uh, cryptography to, to scale it, you basically um, don't really change the symmetry. You, you, the, the guy who makes money is still requiring the same machine that the, the guy who's verifying it in his, in his garage. And regardless of the, of the fact that this miner, this validator can spend millions of dollars at stake or millions of dollars in machine, he will roughly run on the same laptop that you have at home. And so ZK breaks that, breaks that, uh, that uh, parallel. All of a sudden, it, it doesn't matter what kind of machine the validators have, I can verify it on my phone in a millisecond. And so they can have a data center for what I care, I can still verify it on my phone. So the, the Starkware created its own VM called Cairo because the problem that we have with existing VM is that they are optimizing for a different programming paradigms that um, ZKPs. So the best way to explain it is that you talked before about x86. So your regular, you know, regular VM is optimizing for basically your CPUs and your transistors. And transistors, they know one thing very well, which is Boolean logic and bits and bytes. The thing is what you're in the KP environment, you are working in the arithmetic environment, where the base element you're working with is what we call a field, em a field element, which is basically a, a big uint. And the cheap operation that you get is multiplication, addition, division, subtraction. And Boolean, Boolean logic is expensive. So you, you, you move the model, the model on its head, and there is other differentiation that I can expand on, um, like non-determinism or something like this. Um, but roughly speaking, 
to make a chain that is verifiable, cryptographically verifiable, and very, um, using ZKPs, or validity proof, as you, depending on what you call it, um, you want to have, you, you prefer to have a VM that is optimized for that computing paradigm. And so, um, the specific dimensionality, as I said, is orthogonal to the execution layer. And so StarkNet right now is basically roughly taking the same structure, execution model than, uh, than Ethereum, uh, with a few distinction, like we try to do optimistic ex uh, parallelization, we try to do, uh, we are looking into different da data structure while remaining, using remaining the data structure of ETH, also expanding on what's the new state of the art is coming, like uh, things like Sui Aptos, we are looking into what they're doing because it's cool, it's useful. And so um, what matters is, that, you, that is a separation. So StarkNet is focusing on the, the de separation between the validators and the rest of the world. And then afterwards, we are looking into optimizing the execution layer to provide the, num the, 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 the throughput that everyone expects. I'll just say one last word, because node requirements came up. So I'll just, I'll just make one comment, which is, um, you know, we're in Latin America, and this is a new place for Ethereum to be, uh, I think, you know, having been through a bunch of them, there was a bunch in Europe, etc. I think with fuel and the way that we interpret node requirements, we want people here, not like, you know, in Switzerland, like people here to be able to afford to run a node in this global peer to peer network, um, not only for their own research for building for interoperating with the network, but we want them to be able to afford it. Um, just for the global security of the, the system itself. And so I think with Fuel, we've been designing the best system we can possibly think of, but we're also making sure that when we talk about node requirements, which ends up being really important because it really dictates how much throughput, how much processing you can put through the system, um, you know, I think this is like a very key factor. So, so for us, we would like someone in Colombia to be able to actually verify this and not have to pay an enormous sum, like someone's whole year's wage or whatever it might be to be able to just run a node, you know? Uh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, to that point, the genius of having rollups like the ones you all three are building is not everyone has to run their own node. So that really adds up. Yeah, I think it gets worse for privacy because there's like a censorship component. So um, if you kind of restrict like your kind of nodes to AWS, Google Cloud, and Microsoft, um, quite quickly you don't have a decentralized privacy network, you have FANG. Um, so yeah, our node requirements, we, we, we do the same as Fuel, and we have to kind of think about how do we get it working on a laptop? How do we get like roll-ups actually being built uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer network? Um, and actually, some of the L ones are doing a really good job here. Like Mina's got a model, which uh, is kind of like a f uh, okay, so federated yeah. uh, prover. So I think there's a lot to learn from some of the other chains as well. And, and, and by the way, you said that uh, not everyone has to run nodes. I 100% disagree with that. Okay. We should be able to run node on your phone. You should. You should be, yeah. And, 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 and that's, that's the target. That's what we should achieve. So, so um, maybe it's not practical. And the fact that it's not practical is irrelevant. The fact that it's a goal is what matters. That's what drives us. That's what bring us towards one point. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that, that I I really don't. I really want you know. Ideally, in the future, in future, I would be make redundant to some extent. Of course not, but to to some extent, at least on, on your on your phone, or I, I, you should be able to 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 run the network locally. That makes sense. So, we spoke about all of the UTXOs and stuff, and I know you mentioned about how fuels parallelization and the stuff you're doing with verification is orthogonal. We all over here obviously are Cardano maxis, and we all obviously were quite sad when Cardano couldn't work out with UTXOs. Um, how are you guys doing it possible what Cardano couldn't? And I guess for Starkware, for Louis, <laughs> when UTXOs? <laughs> yeah, I can go first. I mean, I think it, it's, it's the elephant in the room. Um, so currently uh, an Aztec client has to sync every single UTXO, <laughs> test it, see if uh, it's your UTXO, try and decrypt it. And like clearly that doesn't scale. So um, at the moment we kind of use brute force and we have some like very advanced multi-threaded WASM. So like pushing the browser right to the edge of what it can do. Um, and that gets us kind of the current throughputs that we can kind of think about today. To get to kind of, uh, I guess, world adoption, um, we actually have to look at kind of the network layer of privacy. Um, so 
we're, we're moving to looking at using something like NIM. Um, so you can actually request UTXOs from a kind of more centralized data store without revealing uh, who you are. And if the UTXO is completely random, uh, when you request that through like a network layer, privacy layer, uh, you get the same anonymity as kind of a full sync. So there's ways to do it, but it requires kind of the whole privacy stack in our case uh, and some pretty advanced web browser com uh, computations. So I'll address that one pretty simply. So basically, this is one of many things Charles has done to damage the reputation of something completely innocuous to this particular thing. So, uh, so basically, just for some spice for the panel. You yes, know? Yeah, yeah, just a little, little spice. So the main thing is Cardano's model, at least from the way we can interpret it, and this is sort of how we think about it too, is it was implying a certain kind of determinism across the system that was basically blocking or bottlenecking how they were using the UTXOs. For example, if you built something like Uniswap, what would happen is, is and again, this is just my read, so you know, let's fight on Twitter about it or something, but basically you have something like Uniswap, well, you can't really have it because with their model, you had to sort of sign off on the change state, but what if you don't know the change state? So what if there's a bunch of people in front of you and behind you in the mempool who are actually manipulating the state of this one thing? Then when you produce the result of the UTXO, well, you don't know what it is. So in their model, they couldn't do that. So, so it caused this issue where like you would use Uniswap and there'd be like one transaction per block for that one app because you, you didn't know what the state was, so you had to just use it one after the other. Obviously, this is horrible. Like, you know, imagine <laughs> one TX or whatever for, for block for Uniswap on Ethereum. Like, we wouldn't, probably wouldn't even be doing DevCon or something like that, you know? So basically, um, you know, the reality is, is that that was more of a, a design decision on the whole system, and it doesn't actually relate necessarily to UTXOs per se. UTXOs are just a way to notate and define the transaction model, which is, something that you can do in various ways. So with Fuel, if you have a smart contract as an input, you can have like say a Uniswap-like system, that's one input. When the state is manipulated, we basically have an output, so it, it is noted that it changes the state, but like Ethereum, there is this uh, kind of reasonable malleability of what could happen under the constraints of the system, such that you know this output basically is uh, you know, it's notating there's a change, but it's under certain constraints and certain conditions, similar to what we expect with Ethereum and Uniswap. When you use Uniswap, you don't always know what the state's going to be or what it's going to change to, but in Ethereum, we're willing to accept that reality under certain constraints. So I use the word determinism here. Maybe the academics don't like that particularly, but it is sort of how I would interpret the situation. But with Fuel, we don't have any of those problems at all. You can build a Uniswap-like system or whatever, you can use the transaction UTXO model. We get all the parallelism benefits. There's no downsides to that, and it's not an issue. It's really just it was publicized as an issue, and UTXOs were related. But in our case, we have different designs that don't feature this issue at all. Yeah. I, in the context of um, of fuel, is there any problem any problem with composability, or is it because of scripts? Like, do, how do you manage the coding multiple state at the same time? Yeah. So so. Basically, Fuel has just normal smart contracts. So you can have a smart contract that calls many smart contracts. If it does, then you're notating those various other smart contracts as UTXOs as well. They're inputs to the system. You're outputting potential changes. Um, so it's very simple in its design. We've inherited a lot of the work that was done in research for state access list for Ethereum. So really, this is just a reinterpretation of that research, but it's in a cleaned up model, which is in a UTXO setting. So we, again, get all these nice benefits from UTXOs, but we don't lose the user experience or behavioral elements of what we get with Ethereum. So it's a really nice model in that sense. Um, and then scripts just, scripts just allow you to make a transaction and you could say call multiple contracts. So for tran tran you know, prove and transfer from, you have to make two transactions in Ethereum from the origin sender, which is ridiculous. Why are we doing that? That makes no sense at all, and it should never have happened. And the main thing, the main reason why, is because of just the design of Ethereum itself is funneling everything through single accounts, and that restricts you. So, you know, with again a UTXO model and with scripts, you can just have a script that calls, uh, you know, approve and then transfer from in the same transaction, and that's it. And you don't need to deal with that anymore. So it's really not crazy 
it's really actually pretty simple. And again, just you can read all of our work and our research on this, so it's all public and available. Um, you can try the test net. In our test net, we do that already. So it's, yeah, anyway. Um, so the question was, um, how does Starkware look at this uh, question of state management? And basically the question we're asking is here is, uh, can you, how do you parallelize? How do you parallelize stuff, uh, yeah. roughly speaking? Um, so the Star Starknet at the moment do not do parallelization as of now um, because we were focusing on making the whole thing work, right? We had a new VM, a new language. Uh, we focused on making things work. And so we took, we went for the simplest model, which was the one that was um, used in the, and, uh, you know, bulletproof by Ethereum. Um, and now that we have like all the feature set, we are focusing on actual execution scaling. So I just want to say, I want to separate um, a ver a verification scaling from, the, from execution scaling. And so um, one of the things we are going to have relatively soon, which would dramatically improve our, our, the throughput of the system is, optimistic execution. So it's not it's not an ultimate solution. It, it's uh, it's as some downtime, it has a theoretical negative um, um, like um, how to say that um, adversarial and uh, adversarial reaction that could be uh, impactful of the network. Um, we are planning to solve it um, one after the other. It's not right now we're focusing on you know bringing scale. Uh, another thing that we're looking into which is um, Within the line of this deterministic parallelization that uh, UTXO enables, um, we are looking at various data structure, like the I mean, a model that uh, exists in the, in the space. We look at Solana, we look at Aptos, we look at Sui, we looked at all the sort of like chain that are actively um, building through parallelization, and look at how they did it. Um, we, we still want the account model because a lot simpler, and we already have enough. Uh, mind change with like the new language, so we focused on you know bringing it, keep it simple, uh, in in that sense. And but we are looking, as I said, into the new ways other other are doing and take the best idea that exists there. So we should ex you should expect more on that front in the coming month. But uh, there is nothing to announce because it's still in the research phase at the moment. Alpha drop, uh, no, but Starkware does have parallelization, but at the verification level through recursive proofs. Right, so, 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 but that's not, okay, so that's actually, uh, it's, so we are really focusing on the, on, the, on the scaling of the execution and VVM itself. The, 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 the parallelization, the, the, recur the recursion enables you to do parallelization of the verification, but you have to know today on StarkNet, verification is not an issue whatsoever. Yeah. Like the verification, proving is not the issue. Right now, our problem is the sequencer. Our problem is that our execution la layer is pretty bad at the moment. And we're working very actively to improve it by 100x, roughly, in the, com in the coming month. And so uh, recursive proof does enable you to like, scale like, the, very the proving. It also enables you to um, scale the, um, the, um, the execution by basically s going into fractal scaling, um, which is basically the ability, for instance, to have a StarkNet or a StarkNet. And so what before we're talking about this ticketing solution that we don't have to, we shouldn't live in the same environment than uh, Uniswap, then using an L3, you can have this ticketing with the same requirement, the same trustlessness than you would expect on, on the regular L2, but in an environment where the fees are more stable because there is no sort of like strong economical uh, incentive to build like a DEX and so on. Um, so um, to answer your question, um, all those parallelization topic is very high up into our, our roadmap. Um, they are still into research, and we should expect to have th things coming to production in the coming month. But I have nothing to show today. That makes sense. Going. So speaking from the perspective of, say, a DAP developer, not a protocol <coughs> developer, who is trying to use one of your systems. Throughout the panel, all of you have dropped some really, really interesting paradigms. Let's talk a bit more. Like I know Fuel spoke about. Uh, having these scripts and Starkware spoke about having no EOAs whatsoever and direct like contract wallets and you use the term programmable privacy. I'd love for like everyone to like think about what these new features are but thinking about it from a developer or a DAP developer perspective. Yeah, I mean fr from a developer perspective, um, you know, it, it, at Fuel we look at it mainly from a few different points of vision. My own which 
again, is reflective of many, many years of trying to build apps on Ethereum and struggling with a lot of key things in the system that make both the developer experience horrible, um, but secondly, the end result being a sort of odd, disjointed experience between the wallet, what the wallet can do, and then what the application can do. Um, and then as well, the kinds of applications you can design. So with Fuel, we open up a lot of the compute. So you have far more available to you. You have far more memory to use. You have far more um, just, just general compute to, to build anything you, you want. You have more options for uh, user experience uh, with things like account abstraction and with uh, kind of other aspects like native meta transactions. So in Fuel, you can have a party that just builds a piece of a transaction, then you can have another party that just tags on the fee on the other and just send it, and that's it. And you don't need to have this situation where it's like you have to wire through five contracts to have some form of account abstraction. So I think from a developer perspective or looking at the space, um, the thing is there is always gonna be hurdles with a new execution environment, with a new development environment, with um, something that's bridging liquidity. So you're bringing your USDC and everything from Ethereum into Fuel. Mm. Um, but the result is, is that once you're there and once you're actually using it and once you're actually seeing what's possible, uh, I think developers can open their minds a little bit to where Ethereum should go and in, in, in where it will be soon you know, once we go to mainnet. Yeah, yeah native, native meta transaction is pretty cool. I know quite a few companies would like kill for something like that. But also, I, I assume when you said memory, you didn't mean like how in Solidity we have like string memory ABC, you meant more like RAM or something. I, yeah, I mean literal RAM. Yeah, literal so RAM. just having a lot more access to RAM and memory and being able to do a lot more with it and across many other contracts. So just having that kind of access is enormous. Uh, it's huge. Uh, it gives you so much more flexibility because with the EVM and Solidity paradigms, you're so constrained by so many factors. The kinds of designs you can do are extremely limited. So from my personal perspective, I've walked around DevCon a lot. I've heard a lot of new designs for a lot of new DeFi. And to be honest, it's still okay, but it's not what is possible. Like there is so much more um, and it's, it's good, but there's a, there's a long way to go. Um, yeah. Yeah, Joe, go, go for uh, it. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think it's like maybe healthy to kind of also tell developers that not every kind of VM is gonna be suitable for them. Um, so we focus on privacy uh, and you work for Reddit and Reddit has a, a, a point system that's public. So like, that's not really a good fit, like, but like uh, a high throughput VM that kind of focuses on public data may be a better fit. So some of, um, I think our, our competitors in the ZK EVM space kind of pitch everything as possible all the time. And I think that wastes a lot of dev time because you have to kind of go through the test net, try and build something uh, and you realize kind of a while later that it's not possible. Um, so for Aztec, what we really care about is applications that have private state. Um, that could be things like ZK games, um, consumer finance, which is, just doesn't exist on, on DeFi today. We have over collateralized lending. You can't really have consumer finance unless you're willing to have a public passport salary um, address on chain. Uh, so I think privacy is kind of um, what we care about. You're not gonna build an AMM on Aztec because by definition it's it's the ratio of two public uh, pools. So being really transparent about what you can and can't do I think is, is something we all need to do um, to help attract the right developers. So like instead of storing variables in the contract itself, you'd store it in your address kind of thing? Yeah, so each, each user basically controls um, their UTXOs which are encrypted and you can feed those into an Aztec transaction <coughs> and prove something about it uh, and then uh, kind of in an Aztec program, if you if you prove that your salary is above X, you may be entitled to a loan or, or not entitled to a loan. So uh, having that data being able to be fed in as an encrypted input to a program is uh, really powerful in our case. So you mentioned how s some zero knowledge VMs are now realizing some of the things they ran into. Can you expand a bit more just for all of us? I just mean like I think uh, you need to kind of, <laughs> let, let me think a second. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, it's hard to do privacy in some applications is all I'm going to say, and then I'll, I'll see what Louis has to say about that. I mean, 100%, <laughs> and, and so StarkNet is not built for privacy whatsoever. Yeah. But that's not nature. Uh, what's, what's true is that you can build privacy protocol on top 
of it. And so I was literally saying in a random idea oh, yesterday to, uh, to Joe here, why not uh, uh, Noir, I mean, um, Aztec and, and Noir as an L3? You know, I mean, there is no reason or not. You could have, you know, this scale of composability, just not the same purpose. Um, so you ask what kind of like things you can, like, you know, things you can build. So the main thing that you can build on Starknet, I always give like a three, to it as a dev, the only thing you care about, three things, which are you get cheap computation, cheap core data, and icon abstraction. And you get like a, a three and a half, which is a long-term vision of scaling, which means that even if you're priced out of this layer itself, you can go a, a layer up, which will be cheaper. So what you get when you get those three things, you start having new projects. So I, as I named before, the ability to, a kind of abstraction gives you the ability to sign with your phone without having private key per se. It's your, your phone literally is a private key. Um, so now when you, com you combine, uh, for instance, cheap computation, uh, you start to have people making uh, physic engine on, on, on the blockchain. So I have, we have someone, a company called Topology on Starknet that is building um, a physic engine. So you can prove collision, you can prove like, you know, games that's existing in the 80s or 90s, uh, worms, like, you know, you can make that happen directly on chain. Um, you can implement things like um, infinite risk, you know, like uh, uh, an infinite map using um, a Perlin noise or sort of advanced algorithm that generate maps. Um, and we have those people making it today on, 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 the, mm -hmm. on the ecosystem. So when you get cheap core data and cheap computation, uh, you get things like that are were not possible in Ethereum before, like practical storage proof. So if you're not familiar with storage proof, storage proof enables you to prove the state of ETH in the past to ETH in the present. So why is that useful? So it's useful, for instance, for voting. So you know when you vote, you basically vote using the token balance that you had at that proposal. Same variation. And so this company called Erodotus is building this, and they already have a snapshot trying to create L1 voting through L2 using their tech. Um, in the uh, now the amount of um, 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 so what, what else? Uh, I think very exciting. I, I feel uh, we have a lot of on-chain gaming because on-chain gaming was completely moved out, priced out of Ethereum. And the proof is. Uh, the only existing on-chain game today on ETH is basically on Gnosis chain, chain it's called Dark Forest. Yeah. So we have seen like a massive boom of projects that were priced out that couldn't build on ETH, building on us. Things and you know even like flagship like Loot, literally building their own universe on, on, on Starknet right now. Thank you so much. Yeah, I know we're running out of time. All I'll say is to all the dApp developers, I think because we work in crypto, we kind of owe ourselves to test and prod. I say that as a meme, but what I really mean is, I think we are here to experiment and try these new languages like Sway and Cairo and Neuer and stuff. So I hope you all like actually go out and at least read up on what these <coughs> cool things are doing. I don't know if you have time, but I'm ha we are happy to take one or two questions if anyone has. Hello, uh, very interesting, very interesting, very interesting, very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question: Why create? Why each one di create their own different language instead of using something more standardized like Circom or even no, I don't know C plus plus? I'll just say for for our case, um, none of the languages other than Circom are built for kind of private state, um, and, and we found that. Um, Circum was too low level, um, and we're trying to target kind of Web2 developers or Solidity developers, and they shouldn't have to kind of know how to be a cryptographer. So our language abstracts the cryptography part, um, so you can just write an application, and nothing was out the box. Um, so is it, is it working? Yeah. Uh, Circum is not Turing complete, as simple as that. And so uh, if you want to do an if statement, which you kind of need for, so Starknet is an OS. The real name of Starknet is an operating system, right? Starknet OS. And so everything, every syscall in Starknet is written in Cairo. So if you don't have a sys if statement, your program is going to be quite big. Um, and um, so another thing that uh, Circom doesn't allow you to do is being able to prove multiple programs within the same proof, which is something that Cairo through Sharp enables you to do. And so we needed to create our own language for that purposes. And finally, um, Circom is, I mean, I guess it's actually true. Right? So we've targeted since Snark, but that's not true. Really, well, yeah, remove that, that, that part. But yes, not turning complete, not being able to prove multiple programs using the same proof. Yeah, and in, in our case, um, you know, we really, really, really didn't want to create a new language. We looked at a lot of options. Um, 
the main reasons are the some of the existing programming languages like C or Rust, for example, they're really not designed to target a blockchain, and there's a lot of different ramifications around targeting a blockchain system that you want to catch in different stages of, of the compiler. So that was one strong motivation for us to have our own language. Um, secondly, the compiler and the tooling have to work really hand in hand. So in a blockchain environment, you want the developer to have extreme control over every aspect of the system so that they can really simulate everything. So the developer experience was another. And lastly, we wanted to create uh, a Rustish like language that really targets blockchains, not just the fuel VM. So the way that our compiler is designed is such that, you know, and this is unlike others in the space, it's designed to be very modular. So if we want to target a backend, you know, like uh, like you know Cairo, or we wanted to target the mine VM, or we wanted to target a different language, the language ecosystem will be set up to target many different kinds of blockchains, including the EVM. So one we're working on right now is targeting Yule, uh, and that's with Foundry. So you'll be able to use Sway and maximize its value and its design um, without having to want to rebuild languages again. Now, mind you, I think some of the ZK teams have different criteria at different stages of the compiler that they really have to factor into their design. So, like, you know, we can't speak for all ZK VMs or anything, but it's a good harness of a blockchain language that's rustish that people will like. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I'm not sure how relevant the question is to your uh, environments because I haven't looked too deep into it. But if you build something like uh, an Uniswap on it, which like excludes Aztec already, would MEF be a problem on those networks as well because the indexes could uh, sort uh, transactions differently or is it somehow solvable? We have right now on Starknet, I think, top of mind, five different Uniswap V2. So the answer is no, <laughs> it's not a problem. And um, no, that, that was a joke, but uh, no, it's not. E Starknet use currently uses the exact same uh, data structure, the model than, uh, than, than Ethereum. So it doesn't really exclude Aztec. Like w we have swaps uh, from Aztec Connect to, to Uniswap and uh, probably the li most liquid Uniswap uh, because it's on mainnet. So uh, liquidity doesn't get fragmented. Uh, we just have to kind of acknowledge that Uniswap's a public uh, application. So we can't make it private, but we can make the users private. So users come to Aztec. And in this case, they bridge out to L1 in a batch to get scaling and privacy. Um, so. Yeah, it's possible, but it just requires a different kind of paradigm um, uh, to normal scaling. Yeah, and then for us, um, you know, we don't make any claims about MEV, uh, so you could probably extract it um, if you know in a decentralized sequence um, you know, setting. But uh, I will say that we actually take a slightly different approach in the sense that we actually want to give the node as many abilities as possible to extract as much MEV as possible. Uh, or provide teams that either try to fight MEV or actually try to advantage it, um, the best tools that they can have. Uh, because we don't really, we don't have a solution for it, but we know there's in incredible teams either <laughs> advantaging it or trying to reduce it or solve it. So, um, but either way, doing MEV facility and fuel should be very interesting. Yeah. yeah for, for internal Aztec transactions, they're kind of, if they're fully private, you can't see what's happening. So our approach is usually to try and push it to L1, and then you can use something like Flashbots to kind of solve it in the way we currently know how. But uh, yeah, if there was kind of public components to an Aztec L2 application, um, then there would be MEV um, on the network. But yeah, I think trying to push it to L1 is, is a good strategy. Well, thank you so much, everyone.